So as we continue our look at the musculoskeletal system, let's begin by understanding the first type of muscle that's of interest to us, and that will be the skeletal muscle. So this will be the first part in this, so skeletal muscle one. As we go through the skeletal muscle, let's take a look at figure 50.26 in order to visually represent what we'll talk about in this flowchart. So let's begin by understanding the purpose of a skeletal muscle. What is its overall and main function? We'll do that over here. A skeletal muscle is going to be responsible for movements, and remember mechanical force is another way to say movements, fancier way to say it, but specifically of the skeleton, and that's why we have the name here, skeletal muscle. So we're trying to move the skeleton. And this is going to be done in a very specific, systematic, and highly organized way, as we'll see. In order to move the skeleton, you have to move a bone. So that means a muscle and a bone have to be very much related to each other for this responsibility to be fulfilled. So how can we do that? We utilize a different structure, and we'll state the following. Muscles themselves, in order to move bone, in order to move the skeleton, in order to be skeletal muscle, muscles have to be attached to bones. And this can happen by a specific structure attached to bones, thus the skeleton, via a structure that we can broadly consider tendons. And tendons are simply going to be tough cords made of connective tissue. Okay, Tough cords made of what we term connective tissue. And it makes sense that they're made of connective tissue because what are they doing? They're connecting muscle to bone. So in order for a muscle to move bone, you have to make sure that the muscle itself um, and the bone, this relationship is mediated by a, via these tendons. So that's our basic understanding of skeletal muscle and how it works and why it works the way it does. So muscle plus bone attached via a tendon. So let's take a look more at the muscle, the skeletal muscle specifically, and now let's look at it at a more cellular functional level. And in order to do that, a skeletal muscle, which is a broad term, can be broken down into a simpler form, into a more, let's say, a subunit form, which would be a muscle fiber. So a muscle fiber is going to be a structure that if you put many muscle fibers together, you get one large skeletal muscle. Figure 50.26 does a good job of showing you a skeletal muscle as a whole and then a subunit of that skeletal muscle called a muscle fiber. We can broadly consider a muscle fiber the following. A muscle fiber will be considered a long cylindrical, so it has a shape like a cylinder, it's very much stretched out. It's a long cylindrical multinucleated cell. So this is an interesting part of muscle cells. They are a multinucleated cell. So we're looking at a functional unit right now. It's a multinucleated cell, and this is done because of the fact, and this is sort of accomplished because during development you had several cells fused together. Several cells fused together, and every cell contains one, nuclei, one nucleus. You fuse several cells, you get many nuclei, multinucleated cells. Several cells fuse together um, to create this fiber, to create this functional unit called a fiber um, in the development. And we are going to consider the muscle fiber sort of a subunit, I should say, um, of the skeletal muscle. So we have this multinucleated cell as a result of many cells fusing together during development. So this is a process that occurs during organogenesis, during differentiation, etc. That's what we're working with thus far. Take a look at the figure to understand what a muscle fiber really looks like. Now, in terms of a dissection of a muscle fiber, we can go even further um, down and sort of look at the details of this structure um, in a look at its components. So let's look at some of the things that make up a muscle fiber, which muscle fibers themselves make up a skeletal muscle. Understand the hierarchy that will develop here. The components of a muscle fiber are as follows. One of them to sort of get off the bat, it's a very important component that will come later when we look at the function of this structure, are T-tubules. T-tubules for right now, just know that they are going to be infoldings of the muscle fiber plasma membrane. So the infoldings of the plasma membrane. That's all we'll say thus far. That's all we need to know for right now. Just get that definition out of the way. 
In addition to T-tubules, another definition, another component to just get out of the way for right now is the sarcoplasmic, sarco, not plastic, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is more commonly just referred to as the SR. This is a very simple thing to remember. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is just the same thing as an endoplasmic reticulum, but it's the specific ER of muscle fibers. So if a muscle fiber, if you're looking at the ER of a muscle fiber, you're looking at its sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we'll state that the SR is the specific ER, it's the specific endoplasmic reticulum found exclusively in muscle fibers. That's kind of what makes muscle fibers the way that they are, so specialized and differentiated. They have T-tubules, not seen anywhere else. They have sarcoplasmic reticulums, not seen anywhere else except for in the muscle. So we have two very characteristic components, and one final sort of broad characteristic component that's worth mentioning is the following. Muscle fibers are further, I would say, subclassified and subcharacterized by another substructure within them called myofibrils. So this is now another level of the hierarchy. This is a many myofibrils, I'll tell you right off the bat, make up a muscle fiber. Many muscle fibers make up a skeletal muscle. Understand how we're building this, or sort of breaking down, I should say, the skeletal muscle. So now we have a muscle fiber. Within the muscle fiber, we have T-tubule, sarcoplasmic reticulum, yes, but we also have a structure called the myofibril. Myofibrils themselves are the following. These are going to be long fibers, and it makes sense that they have this elongated structure because these are long cells to begin with. So these are long fibers that are within, they are found within the muscle fiber. So they're a step below in this hierarchy of structural units within muscles. They long, long fibers within the muscle fiber, um, within muscle fibers. And I should also state that they run lengthwise. The entire length of the muscle fiber will have myofibrils covered all, all along it. And this is better seen in figure 50.26. Trust me on that one. And then finally, within myofibrils, which are a part of muscle fibers, which are a part of skeletal muscle, all the way at this level, we have two more subunits to look at, two more parts of this hierarchy, and there are going to be called filaments. There are two types of what we term as filaments. So what are these filaments? They're going to be uh, two types, as we stated, and they are as follows. One of them is referred to as the thin filament. And from this point forward, any time you mention or see thin filament, always, always, always think of actin. Okay? It's more commonly referred to as just actin. Actin, thin filaments. Actin, thin filaments. Never forget that association. Actin is part of the thin filament. Okay. Hopefully that's driven home. The thin filament itself contains two strands of actin. So to comprise one thin filament, you have two strands of actin. Actin is what we'll state right here. Actin is just a contractile protein. Now, what is contractile? What does that refer to? Remember what muscles have to do. Their job is to provide mechanical force, to produce, generate mechanical force, to move the skeleton. Contractile proteins are going to contract. They are going to allow for such movements to occur correctly. So if we have a contractile protein like actin, we're well on our way to doing this movement of bones, movement of the skeleton. So actin is just a contractile protein, and also just remember that it has these structures called myosin binding sites. We'll leave that as is for right now. No further explanation just yet on what these are for, this MBS. Just know for right now it's a protein that will contract, that will be a part of muscle contraction. In addition, the thin filament, the actin filament, therefore, contains what are known as regulatory proteins. So regulatory proteins are things that regulate, that are going to control actions that occur at the cellular level. And these are, for right now, we'll just state the names. We won't go any further than that. We'll talk about them as we move along. One of them is tropomyosin, and the other is called troponin. 
You may have seen troponin as the troponin complex. I think it's fine to just state that there's tropomyosin and troponin. More on both of those later. Figure 50.26 does a good job of showing you the thin filament within the myofibril as a part of the muscle fiber, as a part of the overall skeletal muscle. And then finally, the last type of filament to understand here, um, of the two filaments that make up a myofibril, one of them is a thin actin filament, the other is a thick filament. So it's very easy to remember, they're opposites. The other one is a thick filament, and this one is just more commonly referred to as myosin. So let me write this correctly. M-Y-O-S-I-N. So myosin, thick, myosin, thick, never forget that association. This contains about 350, that's a lot, 350 myosin contractile proteins. So these are also proteins that will be involved in movement, in contractions. So 350 myosin contractile protein molecules are going to make up this thick filament. So we have myosin here, thus we call this the myosin thick filament. We have actin here, thus this is the actin thin filament. And within these, each of these myosin contractile proteins, we'll state that each myosin, each contractile protein is going to be with a head region and also a tail region. So there will be a myosin head and a myosin tail, 350 of them, since there's 350 myosin molecules that make up the thick filament as a part of the myofibril. The head, the myosin head, is what sticks out from the molecule. That's all we need to know for right now. It sticks out from the myosin molecule. So it's a very noticeable structure, especially underneath the microscope. And the tail is going to be the part of the myosin that will associate with each other. This simply means that the tails will interact with each other and sort of wrap around each other. And this is essentially what forms the thickness of the myosin contractile protein. Why is the myosin contractile protein having this thickness? Well, that's because it's the thick filament. Notice that if you have many tails wrapping around each other, associating with each other, 350 of them, you're going to get a pretty thick overall filamentous molecule known as myosin as compared to only two strands of actin. Thus, you see two strands thin, 350 strands thick. Makes sense, that association. So this covers our introductory look at this structure within the muscle fiber called the myofibril. We'll continue looking at this hierarchy. Please, please, please look at figure 50.26 to visually see the skeletal muscle, the subunit muscle fiber, the subunit myofibrils, and the sub-sub-subunits of the thin and thick filaments.